Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, welcome, welcome to Facebook Live. It is February 2nd, uh, 2022. So it's two, 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 a lot of twos. Uh, must, have, must have been some kind of a spacious day other than the fact that we in the United States are experiencing like a winter storm that is coming through. So there are different areas of the country that are affected by it. <clears throat> so hopefully everyone stays warm and stay safe. Today I have um, some members of our panel and a lot of members from our Facebook community, our, our core group of meditators as well. So I'll start off introducing everyone. Um, we are joined by April, who is our psychic and a spiritual teacher. She actually has quite a few other modalities of healing. I'm just going to mention one so that we don't go through the whole resume. So good evening, April. She's here. And then uh, our wonderful Eileen is here, who keeps us all streamlined. Good evening, Eileen. Eileen is a mindfulness instructor as well. So if anybody's interested in uh, group meditations or um, I think she does it on virtual reality. So if you all have a Oculus, then you can join her in virtual reality as well. A totally different meditation experience. So that's available as well. And then we have Michelle, who is a member uh, of our core group of meditators. Good evening, Michelle. And good evening. And then we have Marla, who's here, who is also part of our core group. Good evening, Marla. And Patricia is here. Good evening, Patricia. And then also Ken, who has fearlessly been here through all these winter storms being in the most northeast part of the United States. How many inches of snow did you get, uh, Ken? Or feet, I should say, not even inches. Inches is beyond. Yeah, we got 18 inches. Wow. And, uh, yeah, it was a very enjoyable storm, I have to say. I really enjoyed it. And you know, so many people out afterward the next day the families were together, people were laughing, smiling, helping one another. It was really a delightful time, really enjoyable. And there would have been a time where people would have, would have been irritated by it all, right? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's strange how different perspectives make us uh, joyful and delightful about even a challenging life situation. Absolutely. So, thank you, Ken. So today I wanted to start off with Michelle asking April if you want to answer, because this is like a perfect question to start for April, and then we'll go around and speak about it. So Michelle, did you want to ask your question? I think you're on mute. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. Th Thank so you. yesterday, um, I was listening to one of Eckhart Tolle's talks. It was in, in response to a questioner's question. And it was, is life after death an egoic concept? So, and then I, I was in the car with my husband and we were having this discussion about karma and the soul's purpose in all of this. And so I wasn't brought up my conditioning doesn't come from the idea of reincarnation and karma. So only in the past years when I've been like working on spiritual development that it has come up, right? So, um, and then a lot of other religions also believe in reincarnation. So I was wondering what the role of the reincarnation and karma, acquiring the karma and then dissolving it or transforming it or burning it up, whatever the terminology is for that. Um, so in listening to Eckhart's response regarding his thoughts on reincarnation, the questioner thought it might just be kind of like the ego's way of taming that attachment to life to form. 
And of course, Eckhart provided a beautifully insightful response, which I cannot paraphrase. Um, I suggest listening to that to that um, that question and answer uh, segment. But he did, but he didn't go into that concept of karma here. Um, I'm kind of on the fence. Not part of my upbringing and conditioning. Uh, that's always that stickiness, right? But then, as I was discussing it with my husband and we're actually talking about karma and I was trying to work it all out in my mind and like how the soul, why would, you, why would God want the soul to come back? Like that whole thing about coming back and the soul acquiring more and more consciousness and awareness. And then as I was working it out on my mind, I'm on the road and I see a big billboard saying karma, truck delivery or maintenance and I'm like at the precise moment and I'm like okay I have to pay attention I have to pay attention because I, that just blew me away and then today I'm, I'm going visiting my mom and then on the television it says something else another advertising about karma and I'm like okay so <laughs> I, then I said to I said I have to ask Poonam to if we can talk about this because I think I still need to kind of get it more like my mind is questioning and you know, I want answers, right? But so thank you for indulging me. Thank you, Michelle. April, do you want to start? Thank you. So am I understanding like, Michelle, you don't know if you believe in karma? Is that like, you don't believe? You don't know if it's real? I think I, I've like always been on the, Fence. Like I, I always, I believe that I guess it's the whole thing of karma and reincarnation and how you accumulate the karma, but how do you dispel it or how do you burn it up? So you become more and more awakened. And so the cycle, right, is where, I don't know. I just, I guess it's, it's a concept to me and it's not something that I've integrated completely but I'm kind of heading to it makes more sense to me as I contemplate it, but it helps when other people talk about it to help kind of make it more sense for me. So when it comes to Eckhart, Eckhart, when it comes to these kind of matters, Eckhart doesn't really have that knowledge. He, and I love Eckhart, but when it comes to like, um, reincarnation, karma, cosmic dimension type. Eckhart doesn't really have that knowledge. Um, I think he has a little bit. I think he has a perception of it, but um, he he just doesn't have the deep, the depth. That's what I've found. So for him, you know, I remember the a few uh, lives back when him where somebody said uh, to Eckhart, "You're struggling to answer this." that's that's why because he doesn't really have these concepts um i could see where uh karma and reincarnation could be an ego concept i could see that definitely um but from what i know from uh talking to people on the other side and then just learning and uh feeling the dimensions feeling Space, uh, there is reincarnation and there is such thing as karma. It is about a journey, almost if you can, just to make it kind of simpler, to make it like starting out in kindergarten and you move up through the grades. Um, and I'm just putting it that way to make it like easy to understand, to grasp. Um, you know, just look at our Deepak Chopra had a really good series called How to Know God. And in that series, he talked about how our concept of God is started out very um, barbaric and it that itself has evolved. Um, you know, so it is like starting out from the bottom where you look at just our societies and where you could you could pull up the the west for example um it was pretty rough right and we've evolved so it's very much like that so is there karma yes 
is there reincarnation? Yes. Is it to evolve? Yes. Is it to work out and learn and clean up some karma? Yes. And then you have the whole thing like, well, then am I gaining karma in this lifetime while I'm trying to clean up? (laughs) Because I think part of you is thinking, well, then I'm gaining more karma because, and that is true to a certain extent until, um, you know, you live your life like Eckhart, where it's fully enlightened and everything you do comes from presence power. Everything that you do, uh, uh, every interaction that you have, you pull that presence power. Uh, When we become Christ-like, and that's not Jesus-like, that's Christ-like, that's when we start to get off this karmic wheel, right? And that's my perception of it. Um, I personally would like to uh, get rid of my karma, and I was speaking to Kelly and Kelly, and I think that's one of the reasons I have so many children. That's one of the reasons I also think that maybe I'm a counselor is because all these souls that perhaps I gave a dirty look to in another lifetime, I am here helping them this time. (laughs) I am clearing up all of this karma, right? Because my soul said, that's it. We're going to move forward. Um, So, but it is something you have to embrace in your own way and in your own, uh, you know, your own time too. When I was talking to my husband about the concept of like, right, we lived in these 50 years where we've kind of lived in your time frame, right? When you go back historically, what happened in the Middle Ages and the atrocities, like the square, right? Where they would hang people or guillotine people right in front of it, it would be like a sporting event. Like, you know, coming back, I guess your soul, the God wants to reawaken in, in, in this form, right? In this dimension. And we have come such a long way, even though there's such a long way to go, right? Still what it is, is that we, we came from one and we're separate. And until we learn that we are one, that's what the problem is. So we came from one and then we decided that we were separate. We were uh, individuals, we were all different. Right. And what the goal is, is to learn again that we are all one. We're all connected. We're all love. When we can do that, when we can learn that. And if you look at our history, we certainly have not done that. But I do think we're in, in a certain, I do think I think of all like the civil rights movement, right? Gay, you know gay marriage, disability rights, like all these rights, at least in, in, in this country, because it's the only one that I've do, really lived in, that we're, even though there's still so much dysfunction, collective dysfunction on so many other levels, on some level, we have made some strides yeah, towards yeah, you know, awakening consciousness, right? I mean, not to say we don't have a long way to go, but comparatively we have- speaking. All of those events, each of those events were meant to show us that we're all one, that, you know, we don't slave people. That's not right because we're all one and we all have love and hearts and, you know, that. So all of those events were meant to show us as humanity to love each other, that we're equal. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, April. I feel, you know, one of the things that I learned, Michelle, is uh, I don't know if it was uh, during his teachings uh, on uh, Amazon, there was this uh, series called the Great Series or something uh, great. uh, It's like courses, great courses. And they had one on Gnosticism. If you look at Gnosticism, the way... So this is like the mystical part of Christianity, right? If you look at the Gnostic teachings, they do believe in the reincarnation or or the fact that everything came out of source, one source, right? So it almost may be that, uh, I don't know if uh, the professor then I don't know where, one of these teachings I learned that 
one of the things that the church has done is taken that disempowered human beings because the Gnostics were so powerful. They had their own contemplative practice. They had their own mystical practices. They knew how to ascend. They knew how to raise their vibrational frequency, right? And then the church disempowers it and says, no, you come to me. You come to me, the Pope, or you come to me, the Cardinal, or you come to me, the Bishop, you come to me, the preacher, to learn what it is to be right as a, pre uh, as a religion. All that you are disempowered completely until you come to Jesus or come to me. But that's not what Jesus ever taught. Right? So that is something that needs to be understood in proper proper context that the religion, each religion can mis misinterpret. Um, I was just uh, telling my cousin about, um, so in India, we have this uh, religious, I, I think people may have uh, heard of this incarnation called uh, Rama, Lord Rama. You know, we have different gods. We have uh, Rama, we have Krishna, we have uh, Shiva. So Rama is an incarnation of Vishnu. And uh, in his story, he shows that um, he gives up his life for his parents, right? In dedication of his parents. So he, um, his uh, father asks him for an oath or something, but then human beings, miss, they believe in that. It's a belief. They start to believe that and they disempower themselves by saying, oh, I need to take care of my parent. And they, they forget about their children. They are, they're ready to leave their children or their wife or whatever their responsibility is because they believe Rama did that. You know, it's a blind belief. So we have to take all our religious teachings in the proper, what was Rama actually, Lord Rama, Vishnu in that incarnation, what was he teaching? instead of extracting, extricating that real context or what Jesus extricating the real context, right? And I like uh, uh, Eckhart's explanation of what did Jesus do? He surrendered, like, you know, the whole being on the cross, like his arms spread about, apart. He shows surrender. And that is the highest vibrational state, right? The art of allowing, surrender to what is, no matter what is. That's what Eckhart is teaching as well. So instead of interpreting the scriptures correctly, then we start to say, oh, I'm not even going to believe in reincarnation just because my scriptures didn't teach me that way. But we have to see what is the actual mystical portion of Christianity, not what the preachers teach, not what a church taught you, not what, what a certain cardinal or pope or whatever has taught you. What is the actual teaching? I, I would say look into that and look, in, look into Gnosticism and look at the mystical practices and you'll find it so similar to Buddhism. You'll find it so sim similar to Zen, so similar to, it's a contemplative, I mean, we know, right? Unless we are contemplative, we go into reflect inner reflection, we are not going to ascend. The transcendence won't happen. So if all the pointers are towards that inner uh, contemplation. So... Thank you, April. Eileen, do you want to say something about this? Other than, than the many lives that uh, April talked about? I had planned on it. And then the more we were talking about it, the more questions I feel like I was having. <laughs> um, I, um, I guess I can only really speak to what um, I kind of feel like I've personally experienced before I never really had any thoughts on it at all it was like yeah I could go that way or not go that way um and now like I feel like I um deeply believe in um you know this idea that um our soul our spirit 
isn't done now. Like, do you know what I mean? Like that will, so that, I guess that's that idea of reincarnation. So um, I just, I struggle with the word karma, I guess. I do think that there are um, patterns and conditions and generational trauma. I totally, totally get that. I help people with that. I had students, friends, family, neighbors um, deal with that. I've dealt with that. Um, I don't know. I think that just the word karma gets me like mixed up because um, it probably is the same thing as what I do believe in. I just don't really use that word, I guess. Um, and so I, I struggle with that. But to me, I think it's probably the same thing as what I do believe that that um, those patterns and conditions are kind of built into our DNA. Like it's it goes through the generations until something changes it. So like I have done, I've, you know, healed that generational trauma of suicide. We have completely healed that. That's done. That's not going any further. Um, but I don't know, I guess it would be considered karma. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you, Eileen. And karma, the way, uh, even Eckhart, the way he he's talks about it, it's not the traditional what goes around comes around. Yeah. It's not that. It is just that we are, karma is the memory patterns in us that we are born, as soon as we are born, then we have a certain amount of memory of yes. uh, conditioning, right? Like you see, I've seen uh, videos of uh, two-year-olds like hitting. How did that two-year-old learn how to hit? Right? It, it, it's just, or, or a baby like waving its arm, like it doesn't want something. It's just hitting the bottle or hitting something. How did it know to do that, right? There's memory stored in the cells. Every, we have trillions of cells. Each cell is a computer by itself, yep. right? So that karmic memory, um, and uh, Sadhguru does a very good job in his book called Karma, where he goes into this elemental memory, this karmic memory. I mean, there's ato um, atomic memory, there's uh, all the different levels of memory that is stored as karma in a, in a human being, he goes into it in the book called Karma. He labels it karma. But karma is not uh, what goes around comes around as such. I know, I just think that that word has, I don't know. A punitive, a punitive yeah. kind of like almost sense to it, right? Like that, you in somehow brought it on yourself. <laughs> I think we bring things on ourselves in this <laughs> present day, um, but we didn't bring the past onto ourselves. That's just there. And so, for example, who am I think I was talking to you about this before on the phone? My um, my daughter has been struggling for a couple of years with severe separation anxiety, and she was always very, very um, independent. My son was like that, but not her very, very independent, but at all of a sudden at seven years old, eight years old, by nine years old, she had this real, she's almost 10 now, it's real intense separation anxiety. And it was very, um, although she's had some trauma around loss and stuff, she um, is very intense. And in a phone call I had with Poonam one day, I was like, I, I get it. I know how it feels. I know it. I remember. And I started telling Poonam a story about when I was just about 10 years old <laughs> and I had gone on my first like um overnight camping trip it was like supposed to be for two weeks a girl scout camping trip and um how it was an extremely traumatic event for me because I suddenly was away from home after being abandoned at five years old 
suddenly five years later after living in a loving home was suddenly alone away from my family and it was just traumatic and it stuck with me all the way until I was like 14 years old it was it was awful and I was talking to Puna on the phone and I was like oh my gosh it's like that it's just like in there I you know gave birth to her and it's just like in there and so now we're working on you know getting rid of that dissolving that so that it doesn't continue um but yeah I totally totally get that I just I guess I'm just not a fan of that word yeah and then what is also interesting is you know because I do also like listen to Ram Das and the whole um tradition right from um the Bhagavad Gita, I'm sorry if I pronounce the name incorrectly, but all the Hindu teachings are um, the Vedas. And so you also are trying to heal your ancestry line, right? Going back and then going forward. Yes. So it's a lot to kind of wrap your mind around, like how that, I guess I'm curious how that all works, get a deeper understanding of that. You know, there's a lot involved in all of this, you know? To grasp. We uh, we discussed it in quite a few Facebook lives, but Kelly is raising his hand, and I'll introduce since Kelly and Kelly have joined late. Uh, we went through the introduction, so uh, the late introduction. I'm I'm going to uh, introduce Kelly and Kelly. Kelly is a Qigong teacher, and his partner Kelly with an E is also a Qigong teacher and a spiritual teacher. So. Go ahead, Kelly. You wanted to say something? Thank you. Oh my. Do you want to go first? Uh, yeah. Well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go. I was just going to say that with karma, take everything you think you know about it, roll it into a ball, open the window, and throw it out. <laughs> because it's not what we think it is <laughs> at all. Yeah. But go ahead. You can. Yeah. No, I. I wanted to say that mm -hmm. I, I completely agree with what April and Puram both said. Puram especially that it's not the what goes around comes around or that, you know, do, do good things and good things will happen to you. Absolutely not. That's not how karma works. Karma and reincarnation have been so closely associated, especially in the last 30 years in the New Age community and stuff like that, that it's problematic and that people want to constantly do the mental gymnastics to try and figure out how it all works. They are connected, but this is also something that isn't widely understood. And it was more widely understood than we wouldn't be having this conversation. Karma is how you use your awareness, how you learn to use your awareness, your thoughts, your emotions. So your ego attachment influences your karma. Whether or not you're present with yourself influences your karma. Who your parents are is the filter of karma that you are born into. Who you were in past lives determines the accumulation and the core issues of how you use your awareness. And just like muscle memory, like a baby pushing a bottle away, how you will innately and instinctively respond to certain things on deeper levels. Uh, there are a lot of religious traditions out there that uh, edited their works and edited their books to remove reincarnation and karma. Because then, um, you know, like the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church didn't just disempower the Gnostics. The Catholic Church went to war against the Gnostics and the leaders of the Gnostic tradition and actually hunted them down and killed them because it was such a threat to their power base and to their control over the information. Gnostics believe that you do not need a church, you do not need a priest, you do not need an intermediary between you and God. And that was a that's a big problem for institutions <laughs> that believe in control and having that hierarchy of false power to maintain that structure so that people believe that that is how divine access actually works. Yeah, that you have to go to someone or something outside of yourself. No. Yeah to access that or yeah. to be connected to it, yeah. which isn't true. Yeah. 
And Eileen, I, I can completely relate to your, um, not exactly resistance to the word karma, but the hesitation to engage with that word because it has been used, oh, well, that's your karma. Talk to the hand. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's been so misused because people don't understand it and they just throw it out because they, they're disempowering themselves by using a judgment and a rejection of where someone is at and not even understanding the concept that they're using. So I completely appreciate where you're coming from because I myself, I had resistance to using the word and even talking about it because I didn't believe in the whole, you know, well, it goes around, comes around, it's your, just your karma and the sort of fluffy stuff because while well, I, I grew up experiencing my past lives on a, on a daily basis, on a conscious waking level all the time. And when I had my asthma attacks and had my out of body experiences, um, they would be, it would be even more intense for, you know, weeks at a time afterwards. So the concept of reincarnation is about refinement. We come back because we've gotten to a certain place in our previous life, our previous embodiment, with learning about ourself, with learning about heart space or fear and love and the whole wonderful illusion that we're embedded in. And we come back because we, won't, we keep learning. It's just that simple. It's not a fantastical concept. It's about learning. And I know for myself, I used to have these huge grandiose ideas about Oh, well, this, that, and the other thing, because I was constantly reliving my past lives. And I spent years and years and years disciplining myself to not get lost in the information, to not get lost mm -hmm. in the people that I was talking to on the other side, and to learn how to be present and physically anchored in my body all the time so that I wouldn't get lost in that information and so that I could consciously filter and not get attached, not let my ego try and manipulate me with the information or with all this insight that I had into myself and people around me. Yeah, because when you're talking about past lives, like I also remember a lot of mine too. And when things come up for healing right now, oftentimes I'll have like a past life memory that comes with it. And I remember at first it was that idea of when we we're talking about ego and when we we're just talking about how karma is kind of like a punishment that oh this is what you deserve or yep. you know you're working yep. through this because you were this person before i've come to learn and to understand that it's more about finding your personal power like right now even if you have you know for example like being a warrior in another life where you may have killed people on the battlefield for example it's that was another time and another place and where was your power then and it's not to say that, oh, you were bad back then or anything like that, because you're not bad now. That's not how it works. It's, it's being able to know that you just have something that needs to be released, that you need to accept something about yourself and to find that personal power inside to go, oh, because your ego always wants to tell you that you don't have any, that you don't have that personal yeah. power. So I, I can remember a lot of times with my past life where my, my ego would be like, oh, that, that wasn't a nice thing to do. Like, oh my gosh. But it's turning that around and flipping it over and looking at the, the other side of the coin and, sh you know, shining it up and then saying, well, you know, like that was another time and place and that action, whatever it was, like I was powerful. I was doing what I thought was right at the time because that was the time yeah. and right now I'm choosing to look at things different and I'm choosing to change the way I believe about myself right now so am I going to continue to believe this about myself or am I going to let am I going to let that go mm -hmm. yeah so that's me yeah so two cents yeah it's that. like we, we get attached to this this amazing string of images and movies that we can, well, you know, at least that was my experience. People get infatuated and fixated on their past lives because they don't want to be present. And what it boils down to is being present no matter what level of information is coming through. Being emotionally responsible 
with all of your information all of the time. And that's the discipline of refinement. That's why we keep coming back because we learn stuff and we're here to integrate. We're here to integrate and transmute and to be present with everything. I have a, I have an answer to, is mm. it Patricia? Correct? Her question, the original definition of the word karma. Okay. I just looked it up. <laughs> if I could share that. it Well, this is one of the things that came up. That I'm going to see if I can even read it. Um, it's This is from like Britannica.com, so I don't know. But it says, Pali Kama, in Indian religion and philosophy, the universal causal law by which good or bad actions determine the future modes of an individual's existence. But in, and then it says, in ancient texts from 1000 to 700 BCE of the Vedic religion, karma referred simply to ritual and sacrificial action. So I don't know if that helps. So it's interesting how the definition of something can be changed mm -hmm. yep. throughout yep. time. So anyway. Well, some of, some of, the, just some of the, the traditions in terms of um, the application of the word ritual in that definition, I, I, I feel is really key because the repetition of an action, right? If we are repeating an action, again, that whole banging our head against a brick wall and expecting something to change, uh, that's a karmic framework for how we tend to interact with reality when we're not aware and when we're unconscious and we're not being emotionally present. My understanding, again, the, yeah, karma, you know, Eckhart does, does an okay um, job of defining sort of the ego connection to karma and the way that ego tries to manipulate us with our karma or, ba or basically our, our history, our history with our thoughts. And reincarnation used to be a part of the original uh, Catholic doctrine. Same thing with karma, same thing with the concept of how you use your mind, how you use your awareness, the rituals that we have with our awareness are very important to understand and to look at. Because if we are just blindly following along like a robot, like an automaton on autopilot, then we're repeating the rituals and we're not being aware of how we're actually being used instead of actively participating and using our own awareness to our own benefit, which is to be consciously aware and present with ourselves. Um, reincarnation, every culture around the world has its own traditions around reincarnation. Some religions uh, that have institutionalized their doctrines have generally hide reincarnation. Because what's the point of, of actually trying to control people if they know that they can just come back and start over? Why should they be afraid of hell or afraid of retribution or judgment or redemption issues, et cetera, et cetera, if they know that they're just, they're just gonna die and they're just gonna start over again? If they're gonna have a second chance, if they're continuously gonna have a second chance, what's the point? What's the point of following a doctrinized institution's dogma? And this is the whole reason why the Gnostics were hunted down and and and, and and destroyed is because this is what they believe. They, they didn't believe in the need for an institution. They didn't need an intermediary, a church or priests or, or bishops or anything like that. And the reason why we have bishops and cardinals is because this is the old um, uh, hierarchies of the Italian aristocracy where the Roman church first grew out of or first grew you know, into Vatican, what we now know as Vatican City. So when you understand the cultural connections to the power hierarchies within an institution, as in where did that institution actually start? You got to go back and you got to go into history and you got to go look at what the aristocracy were doing and what the political uh, minefield was like at the time that institutions were being or were grasping for legitimacy and power to keep themselves safe. And this is one of the things that a lot of people don't understand about the history of the, of um, religion in the, I mean, actually, no, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. Religion is religion. Religious institutions all function the same. They all seek to protect their, the, themselves through uh, controlling uh, the, the public. 
and do that through dogma and rhetoric and fear and intimidation. I mean, some of the 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 series on Netflix like Medici and and Borgia, and um, Actually, even Marco Polo, even though there's only two seasons of it on Marco Polo, it's really interesting because you have these Italian merchants who are in the court of uh, Genghis Khan and you, and you have all of their assumptions about the world destroyed because they're in a completely different environment. And you have the, the, these assumptions of these, of these Italian merchants completely upended and realizing that they're absolutely powerless unless they learn how to work in inside the court of Genghis Khan. Or actually, no, maybe during the time Marco Polo it was Kublai Khan. I mm, memory's not sort of working on that. But it's interesting. But it's interesting. The context is really, really interesting in terms of understanding historical context for the origins of some of these institutions is really, really important. The 14th century was huge in terms of the Renaissance happening and certain institutions basically like circling the wagons and in, in, instilling or um, installing even more rigid dogma to control their, their hierarchy, control their power base, and to instill fear and use intimidation through threat of being, you know, you know spending eternity in hell kind of thing. Again, um, yeah, you know, I come from a Roman Catholic background and a Mennonite Christian and a Baptist tradition. So I, I grew up with a grandfather who was a minister. So there was certain things that I grew up with, you know, really, really loud all the time going to his church on, on Sundays and just sitting there going, yep, no, this isn't for me. And just knowing as a kid that I didn't believe, even though I love my grandfather to pieces, um, I just knew, I knew. And, I'm, and of course, you know, I was having out of body experiences with my asthma attacks and, and multidimensional um, visitations when I was a kid. So um, the things that I would hear in church just didn't fit with my actual personal, physical, concrete experiences. Anyhow, my understanding of karma is how you use your awareness. Reincarnation happens, whether or not you believe in it or not. And that's one of the things that I learned in, in one of my out-of-body experiences, that reincarnation re-embodiment the, the embodiment process just happens because it's it's about learning and we will continuously re-embody because that's literally just life we are here to learn it's all about learning it's all about refining our connection with ourselves and we will continuously re-embody until we've got to a point where in our soul development that we're done with reincarnating here and then we'll just reincarnate somewhere else that's my Cool. Four bits. <laughs> Anyhow. A few pennies. A few pennies. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly and Kelly. So um, karma, according to the word itself, means action. So no matter what we are doing, and this goes back to what Kelly said about using our awareness, we are creating action. And Sadhguru has a really good way of saying, even if you're breathing air, we are taking oxygen from the trees and then we are breathing the air. So there's action. We're taking something from somebody and then we're giving carbon dioxide for other creatures to use the carbon dioxide, right? There are certain um, organisms that use the carbon dioxide. So even that, even if you, if somebody said, I'm going to be creating no karma whatsoever and sit in a chair and breathe. And Sadhguru says, even that breathing creates karma. So no matter, uh, if you remember during um, group meditation, I was saying even wiping the kitchen counter the awareness with which if you wipe it as a consecrated action, that I'm imbuing it with presence, then we are putting in that presence, the awareness that Kelly's taught. There's awareness flowing, the consciousness is flowing out from us into the counter and that's proper action. The moment we don't perform it properly, like 
in right, what Eckhart calls right action, we create an equal and opposite reaction. We are sending it out into the universe. And that is the co-creation. My personality is co-creating my personal reality, right? What Dr. Joe Dispenza says, that is how my personality is co-creating my personal reality because everything is karmic action. Even breathing, how I brush my hair, how I wash my face, do a, do, what kindness goes into how we use the water, how, how do we warm up? Uh, and that's why Eckhart says, even if you're doing a cup of tea, look at the presence that can go into the cup of tea. What Kelly was saying, if everything is done with awareness, as long as we imbue it with awareness, then we are performing right action. So it's how it goes back to how you do what you do. You know, you know it very well. It's, I do. Yeah, yeah, I just never connected the dot that with karma. You know what I mean? It didn't connect. And, and now, thank you. Is it connects? And and the reason why the how matters is um, the short form of it. I, I'll try to condense what April said. Uh, I mean, we discussed it, right? The soul was in the other realm. It's going to take birth here to learn, like, one soul may have like envy. I mean, there are quite a few sign archetypes and signature patterns and karmic patterns. And like, let's say envy, anger, uh, um, uh, what are the uh, negative emotions like uh, annoyance, like uh, sadness, resentment, right? They have four things. In this one lifetime, they learn, oh, I shouldn't be envious. And they go back, they pass away, they go back, right? When the soul, according to all the near-death experiences, like uh, Anita Murjani and Dr. Evan Alexander, when the soul is exiting the body, a life review, and even Dr. Uh, I mean, uh, Sadhguru talks about the life review part of it is the most excruciating. I mean, we think life here is excruciating. He says the life review part of it is very excruciating because we are going to feel the pain of each and every person we, that we gave pain to because we're going to see it from the other perspective. Remember, there's a meditation that we do during group meditation called the broader perspective. And she says, take, take go, in, go down the white, um, path uh, with this light, look at your past experiences and look at the experience from the other perspective. That is the life review while you're living. And that's what happens is the life review is happening. And during the life review, the soul will say, okay, I'm going to learn these lessons. And then what is the next birth? Mm -hmm. Is it going to take a next birth or do it in the other realm? Because according to Seth, it can also happen in the other realm. Are you like talking you, about the karmic board review? They call it a life review. And even Sadhguru calls it a life review. That when right. the soul or the spirit leaves the body, there's a, f I wouldn't even call it seconds, like within fractions of milliseconds in chronological time, that person goes through their, right from birth till they passed away, all their actions from the yep. other perspective. I don't know what it is called in other terms. It's called a life review. So that's why Sadhguru, what he says is uh, talking about ancestral kar karma, uh, he says, and especially since we have so much war and we are killing 20-year-olds, 19-year-olds, young people, right? Um, he says we need to perform that last rite. It's called uh, Kal Bhairavi. That last rite needs to be performed properly for all these souls so that when they leave and they come back, they, it, their body, that, that whole cycle is easier on that body. So his uh, Isha Yoga Center, uh, you're in Tennessee. You should, you should inquire, Michelle. You can do life review for your ancestors, I think. I mean, not life review, this Kalbevi uh, process or procedure, whatever it's called, for your ancestors to heal their, um, whatever their karmic conditioning was. 
So this is actually something done while still alive. Cal therapy? Yeah. No, no, it's for a person who's passed away. Ah, gotcha. And you can perform that ceremony. Or they may have passed away like right then. And then like we have a huge ritual, like 13 day ritual uh, after a person passes away for that reason, to make sure that that soul leaves this plane very peacefully. Right. So, okay. Um, Mar Marla, do you want to talk about this? Or do you want to talk about your question? Well, we went in quite a depth um, between April and Kelly, so we can talk about your question. Well, I think that I think Kelly, Kelly and Kelly did did a, a, a very thorough explanation of it. And, and I'm satisfied with that. Um, my question. Um, comes on the heels of, I think it was another question and answer session. And I cannot remember the specific um, words that were said or the specific question. What I remember about it, I think we were talking about manifestation or create creating in this world, because that's what I'm focusing on is creating something here now. And my, uh, what I heard was, um, and I think it was you, Poonam, but I'm not sure, something about when you're creating, just be aware that you're also creating the opposite. I, that is not fitting in anywhere for me. I don't get how that can work. So if, you know, I get it theoretically, I get good and evil, I get, I get the dichotomous creation, the dichotomous nature of reality, um, the reality of opposites, I get that. But I, get, I just keep thinking, if I'm creating the opposite at the same time that I'm creating something wonderful, then how am I making progress? I'm just staying where I am. And I know that's a simplistic kind of way to think about it, but I, I just wonder if I could get some clarity through examples from people. Are there, are there some examples of... of of conscious reality, conscious creation, um, and that includes its its opposite. Who wants to go first? Ken, um, do you know of an answer? I actually had some things to say about the comma. Okay, go ahead. Okay? And then uh, by the time we come to April, we last Barla's question. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, no, I really, it was really, really um, jolting me talking about the karma and what I had to uh, myself is living life invested in what wasn't real. And realizing what karma was for me and how I lived that out was a lot of it was my thinking. A lot of it was the programming. So I built up a lot of karma and until my life had to change. And, um, and then realizing a lot of it, what April was saying, I really, really liked it. And then talking about what Eckhart was, was saying about um, getting into the presence. And I've noticed for myself, even like six, seven months ago, I was still recycling old garbage in some ways. And I was still working through karma because it was still unconscious. And then understanding how things really started to change within myself and even hearing with others, um, by 
by continue doing things and that would bring on my pain and suffering and the pain and suffering was just con continuation of doing the karma work and then the karma would would it would be like almost like the healing would occur once i started healing and once i started working through my stuff and it's funny i was having a conversation with my ex today uh, my ex-wife and we were both saying how incredible our conversations are and she says you had a lot of karma to work through and i'm like exactly so it really appalls me in a way where being in, in the synchronicity of being you know it's like who's doing the teaching and i'm realizing more and more that this loving presence that i'm going to call god spirit is just helping me to untangle the false self and then bringing bringing out the truth and helping me to understand um that what the karma was all about and and then going back to what i'm understanding with uh Eckhart, it's almost like it's a different energy field and i'm realizing i needed to be in because i needed to get out of some way of thinking going back to it going back to it and then even like what i what i call being in this group realizing the presence or the energy field has shifted for me and it's allowed me to understand things more clearly and to and, and, and for me a lot of that was the karma that i needed to let go for I, I kept trying to figure something out and then now realizing there's nothing to figure out just be um so just hearing the different explanations and because of what's being healed in my own capacity of my evolution it's like there are different things that are being rewired healed and i'm having a new perspective even in my language so i'm myself i'm not using the same words the same way of thinking because i'm realizing that my evolution is changing and that being rewired and allowing that energy just to come in just by allowing that being part of me um, is, you know, and, I, and I, I wish I could word things easier. And I do, I, I love the way certain people like, well, well, Kelly words things. And sometimes it's so deep. I'm like, okay, I'm not quite there yet. But when I really do listen and, and whatnot, I, it's almost like putting the pieces together. And then slowly the programming, my, my, my presence programming is changing rather than anyway, I'm not even quite sure how to say it, but I You're doing I, a great job. Uh, thank You're you. Job. All right. And this is why I wanted to get back to this because I realized when something new comes in, I want to be able to express it and hear myself. And then, and then that's when I get the expansion. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you. That was amazing that your ex-wife actually talked about karma and it was circulating with uh, Michelle. Exactly. And right. so right away, and this happened so much where I'm like, and then when you didn't, when you, and then when you didn't pick me, I went, ah, and then you to answer something else. I, and I'm sorry, Mala, I wasn't really listening fully because I had in my mind, I really wanted to say this. So. But I know, and my my ex and I, we're, we're like, and you and Kelly and Kelly. This is a, such a mirror because I'm looking at the two of you, and I'm like, I want what you have. And then you know, it's just it's almost like watch out for what you ask for. But my <laughs> ex and I, I mean, we've spent yeah. years. Yeah, watch, yeah, watch what you watch ask for. Right. <laughs> just, a, lot, a lot of work yeah, involved. This is a lot. Of <laughs> To get but anyway, uh, thank <laughs> you. Uh, you know, it was, that's very nice. <laughs> that's very nice of you to say. A lot of karma. <laughs> lot, yeah, we worked through an awful lot of karma. Yeah, yeah. I understand that one. Yeah, but anyway, I'm just uh, I'm just in a beautiful place, and um, 
my my thinking is just transforming and i'm so much in my heart these days and and i know that's why things are being manifested so thank you thank you grateful for that ken thank you so um marla back to your um uh, question the question is i think the quote from eckhart is the positive already contains the unmanifested negative, right? Okay. So if you are creating something positive, then the other polarity is also created. And it goes back to the same thing what Dr. Joe Dispenza says, there are infinite possibilities. So if in one possibility we are poor, in another possibility in that hologram of infinity, infinite possibilities, we are extremely wealthy. If I'm black in one possibility, I can be a white person in another possibility. In another person, another possibility, I can be brown. Okay. Right? Okay, I, I get that. Um, so th that's what um, Eckhart is saying. So. The example I wanted to give was from um, Abraham Hicks has this uh, beautiful example of she had an Azir where she had like um, beautiful exotic uh, glass uh, figurines or something uh, all decorated um, decorative items like stored and then she hit something they were just uh, not like shelves that were uh, fixed to something. So I think she broke the whole thing. She touched it and she broke and there was glass all everywhere. So the positive of having all that, right? Maybe thousands and thousands of dollars worth of whatever crystal figurines and everything. The unmanifested negative is it can all be destroyed as well. So what Eckhart is asking us to know of is the impermanence of form. Out of saying that, what he's saying is, yeah, you are creating this. Don't get so absorbed, again, freedom from the externals. Don't get so absorbed in your manifestation that your ego gets so attached to your positive manifestation that, oh, I built this 100,000 square foot house or I have a Lamborghini or whatever this manifestation may be, suddenly, you have also manifested, along with manifesting the Lamborghini, you've manifested the other polarity of somebody's going to steal the Lamborghini or it could get scratched or you lose it. That's all. So we, we live with the world of form with a certain amount of detachment. If it's there, enjoy it. If it's gone, it's okay. I, like he says, right? I, you can be in a, he can be in a trailer, like sitting outside in a little chair outside his trailer and be really happy. So, or he can be in a million dollar home and be happy too. So it doesn't matter to him. So that's the polarity that he's making us aware of. But I'll go through everyone and we'd find out. Patricia, you want to talk about Marla's question or uh, what Michelle talked about? Thank you, Marla. Beautiful question. Oh my goodness, thank you. Um, yeah, that was fascinating to listen to both. And I, I'm just wondering how this all connects <laughs> somehow. But first I would like to say something to Michelle because I found it interesting when you, Michelle mentioned about the truck with that karma thing. This morning when I was taking off and getting on the highway, I still had worries, you know, identification, how I'm gonna show up because I plan to introduce myself to my team today, you know, blah, blah, blah. So that I had that all fear, you know, a little bit of like anxiety and performance. And I actually said out loud to myself, approaching the, um, you know, the entry point to the highway, said to myself, I allow this moment to be as it is. And I, I, I really meant it. It's like, I'm not gonna go to my old self and what I'm just gonna just drive my car right now. At the same time, from opposite direction, there was a big, big ginormous truck and 
it, it was turning the opposite way. So I was going uh, south, this thing was going north, and on the big sign was super ego. <laughs> super ego. I didn't even know what was in the truck. It was, there's nothing else. Well, it's super ego, but it was going the other direction. So I'm going, <laughs> I was like, I'm thinking to myself, oh, so that's a sign because I allow this moment to be as it is. The ego is going bye bye. <laughs> it was just hilarious to think that. Um, as far as karma, yes, I, I ask for definition because, again, Eckhart even and a lot of spiritual teachers say use words as just pointers because it's in this in this three dimension dimensional world, you know. But we still try to communicate and understand what it means to us. So I was familiar with the concept of karma and how it is, but I grew up in the Roman Catholic church and I know that they don't, you know, believe or they don't teach a reincarnation. But as we were talking about the judgments uh, on the life, you know, they do that too. They just have image, I mean, from the Catholic Church have that image of judgment. So, you know, you come and you are being judged for your actions. And then depending on how well you lived your life, you're gonna go to heaven, you're gonna go to hell or somewhere in between, which is that uh, pre pre pregatory, I think, that, that you have to kind of relive and suffer again for everything you've done. So when I'm thinking about it, it is very similar <laughs> to really, it's just a different name, maybe different, you know, visuals, but it's, there is some kind of consequence because the other definition I found, um, it's a little simpler and it says that it's the sum. So every single one, it's a sum of person's actions. So it doesn't even say if it's bad, good actions. It's just some of all the actions in this or previous states of existence. So that's where um, April's thing saying that, you know, also the generational stuff. So it's some, so it's hard. It's like, oh my God, you know, from whatever state, however far, which is always in the now, right? So we carrying this. And that is a deciding factor, it's, which is fate in future existence. So my thinking is they, they, in this particular way, they're not even talking that we can actually do something because there's so many things already that happened before we are in the now. And that's supposed to determine how we're gonna live in the future. But then Eckhart, that's why he said it's only only now. So we we either repeating that based on the conditioning, or so because future and you know future and past for him doesn't exist really. So it's like just a concept. So how much of that we carrying into the now? So I'm assuming that it is to answer. I think Michelle, my understanding is that. It's completely ego. Karma equals ego. Mm -hmm. Because it's that experience of the person and then judgments. Because people say, oh, it's a bad karma. Because karma itself is just actions. In they're not saying good or bad because everything consists good and bad in it, right? Because how many times we say that, you know, uh, from something bad, something good will come out. You know, if you think it's a bad event or we did something bad, but then somehow it it turns out, you know, good because it was meant to happen. It was meant to show us something. So it's a blessing in a sense. Um, so I just don't know how much we have actually a say in it on the human level, because I don't think we do. Once we not if we're not connected to the source, everything is really karma, right? <laughs> the minute 
we come out of that physical state, then we are free of it because the one is just not about actions, right? It's just about being. <laughs> so um, that's that's how I that's how I see it, maybe. And as far as the creation, um, that everything that's created, yeah, I think Punam Punam really good that this attachment. It's just the suggestion. Don't to get to attach it's like oh my god look what i did it's so amazing all right it, it, it's amazing it's a painting it's a piece of music you know it's pure creation but just once you're done with it disattach yourself from it move on because yeah when we start judging something bad or good it's again just uh, something probably from ego from two dimension world just i think that enjoyment enthusiasm of creating and then once it's gone that's it <laughs> thank you thank you patricia april did you want to uh, respond to marla's question mm, i don't know the answer to her question i've been thinking about it i'm not sure about the answer to that question, because I think we're talking more about possibility when we're talking more about timelines. And I, I don't know if it's my ego that says, well, let's say I saved somebody's life. Does that mean that I killed somebody's life? Does that, what? I do what really so really um and i think that's what she's thinking like if i do something good then something bad is happening somewhere and i don't know that that's necessarily true um is there is all possibilities available yes um and it is about your point of focus so if I want to create something good, that's where I put my intention. That's where I focus so that I can manifest that. I can bring that to my world. Um, I don't really know the answer to that. Like, I'm still thinking about your question. Your question has made me like, hmm, is that really true that every good action creates the exact opposite in all situations? I don't know. Maybe it does. But because that's not where my intention is, that's not where my focus is, my point of focus, then I don't I don't see it or I don't realize it. Uh, but you know, if I want to be the rich person, yeah, that possibility is there and I draw that timeline to me. But I suppose I could just be the poor person too, and that possibility is there. So I'm not sure what the answer is. Maybe uh, Kelly will be able to clear it up or somebody else, but I don't know. It's making me think. I'm not sure. I'll have to think about it. So I think I have just as many questions as you now. <laughs> Thank you, April. I was going to say something with that thought came, popped in and popped out. So, Michelle, did you want to say something about uh, Marla's question? It, it is a quite interesting question. And yeah, it makes me think too. And I guess what popped into my mind, which is kind of along the lines of what you were saying, Poonam, was watching a documentary, I don't know if it was on Prime, um, about the festivals that the Buddhists do when I don't remember what festival it was, but once I guess it's once a year where the monks get together and they create that mandala and they are blowing through the flute, whatever that instrument is called. And they have to take classes. They have to memorize the mandala. And they were interviewing the monks and some learn it very quickly within a year and others have to be able to sit at the table when they're creating this huge mandala 
everybody has a responsibility, but they all have to memorize every single piece, every single color of that mandala. And they work on it. I don't know how many for how if it's a week or I, I don't remember the time frame, but they're all creating the mandala and they have to take classes before and memorize the mandala. And once that mandala has been created, all that effort, they destroy it. It's just to show you the impermanence of it all. So creation and destruction all at the same time. And that's maybe an extreme example. And maybe we don't see it in the one instant. Maybe it's not correlated at here and now this is going to be good and here and now this is going to be bad. Just like, I, and the other thing that popped into my mind was you fall in love and you have this beautiful partnership. And then there's moments where that person gets on your nerves. And for that instant, you can't stand that person, right? So there's kind of like that love-hate relationship that's saying, but it doesn't mean that within that loving relationship, you have the opposite. There's moments where you have the opposite in it. I think, I, I just don't think it happens necessarily within that same instant. I think it can co If we take time out of the, the equation, then maybe we do see the opposites, right? But I think at the end of the day, it's what Poonam was pointing to. Yeah, the impermanence of everything, you know, like, and I think in my, in my life, I've tried to like, we've built a life together. We've been, you know, married 33 years. And, but as we've grown older, we become less attached to things and labels and, and your ego and your self-esteem and, you know, just letting it all go and on the wayside, you know? But we had the opposite too. You know, we were attached at some points to all those things, right? So I think time makes, makes confuses the whole equation. But I think if we pull time out of that, then we can see, yeah, it, it is both the polar opposites and everything. I'm not sure if that helps, but that's what came to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Yeah, and, and what they do is it's like different beautiful radiant colors and then they mix everything it, they almost is like they take a broom or something and they mix the whole thing up to show the oneness that everything comes together and it's one that's what I feel the way they make the sweeping gesture and create the like mix up the whole thing and it's like beautiful intricate design and then it's collapsed back into this oneness, right? I didn't remember that piece, but yeah. Such a, oh, the, the first, they played it on, um, it may have been the interview of Thich Nhat Hanh, and then they played it on Oprah Winfrey's Super Soul Sunday, right after his interview with her. And that's what they did. Like it's, and uh, like tears fall off. Like when you see that oneness oh my come through, right? So beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that example. Mm. Kelly and Kelly, you'll want to wrap up. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, what I was going to say about that, the co-creation thing that we're talking about, I have, I have a little bit of a different view, but I, I have appreciated listening to everybody's views on it because it, it's very interesting. I, I know from my perspective, I think one thing that I've learned in my own healing journey is that how you can create something that you think is brand new by repeating a pattern. <laughs> and I know, I, like I'll speak, not give detail, but we've created, at the beginning, like everyone says, oh, your relationship is so great. Well, when we first met, we did create, recreate codependency between the two of us, even though we were doing everything completely different. Yep. And I think it's understanding how your ego, your shadow will do that because you think that maybe you have to work with this person a certain way or you have a connection to them and you get attached to that. And then it's being able to see that and break it and go, oh, wait, that we actually recreated something in a new way that we didn't know that you could do that. And it's catching that. Yep. So I think it, it, I don't know necessarily for me and my experiences that it's 
you know, creating something good and negative at the same time. I mean, I suppose you, you could see it that way. I hadn't really looked at it that way, but it's just, it was just that for me to be vigilant, to look and see that how you can recreate something. You think you're doing something brand new, yep. but your shadows got a hold of it yep. and kind of twisted it and made it into an old pattern. And until you catch yourself doing that pattern and go, oh, wait a second, I, I don't want to keep acting that way. I've been trying not to do that. Then, then you can stop that and act different, like do, choose different action. So that, that was, that's my perspective on that, that I wanted to share. So I thought that was a good question because that brought up a lot of good stuff. It, it is a really good question. And um, I have a very um, divergent perspective on this uh short <laughs> short answer is sure. <laughs> um no just no no when you're actually creating something all possibilities are always present in every single moment so worrying about creating something negative because you're doing something good for yourself is just one big no because it has to do with the intention it has to do with how you are using your awareness the intention that you're at actually putting into this and you have to understand that one of the things that you constantly need to be aware of is duality and this is not good and bad or black and white this is about the swing of energy through yeah. emotional extremes that's what duality really is it's not the good and bad fluffy wordplay no Going back and it's forth. going back and forth. This is how codependency happens. <laughs> this is how we can get caught off guard and knock something over and break it. And then we go, oh, well, that was like, you know, my karma or whatever, or blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, no, we, you weren't being, people weren't paying attention. And sometimes that's the whole point. Sometimes that's the whole reason why things happen is because we had all this energy that we were keeping bottled up and we weren't dealing with it. So we need to have an event to let it all come out to see it to feel it so that we can actually be present with it mm -hmm. creating something doing something the most important thing is to be aware of how you are using your energy of your awareness so that you are not recreating karma so that you are not recreating an old pattern and yeah this is one of the things that kelly and mm -hmm. i have we spent a lot of time sort of like we worked through a lot chipping of that. through yeah, yeah. It's like, well, oh, where is a completely new relationship? So this is going to be brand new. It's like, yeah. well, the first part of it wasn't at all. <laughs> you know, just like huge, yeah. huge learning curve. Yeah. Well, and it, it also is whether or not you're creating with your mind yeah. and pushing. Yeah. You can you can definitely manifest things with your mind, like yeah. to be so goal oriented and focused on it and do yeah. it. You, yeah. Yeah. a lot of people do that. But are you creating with your heart? So yeah. what do you want to create with? Do you want to create with your heart and, and feel love and joy in what you're doing? Or are you so focused on, well, I have to have this. I have to have that kind of relationship for me. Mm -hmm. And I think you too, it's all about energy. What kind of energy are you putting into what you're creating? And there are different stages of this. The reality is that when you actually understand how to be disciplined with yourself and hold yourself accountable and present in your heart, in your body, and you actually have stillness inside of you. And that is the main space that you operate from creating becomes completely different. There is no concern about the bad. There is no concern about that swing of the pendulum of emotions. Everything is yeah. pinpoint laser, laser clear. I and want it. No, I don't. I want it. No, I don't. You're yeah, not, you're not going back and forth. <laughs> there, there's a level of acceptance and allowance where there's no mental analysis. There's just uh, an understanding. It was like, this is where we are. This is what's happening. This is what we're creating. This is why we're creating it. And this is the energy we're creating with it. This is why being present with yourself is so important to understand, not just the mental gymnastics and understanding the concepts, but the practice of the discipline of being physically, consciously, mentally, emotionally still because you spent so much time with yourself. Your discipline is that exacting and that precise. So creation happens on many levels all at the same time. This yeah. is why being present with self is so important. So that 
you can become aware if you have a nagging doubt, if you have fears that are attached or that nag at you and like try and keep hooking you into that internal negative dialogue mm -hmm. while you are doing something, then it is really something to look at. And, you know, maybe it's a red flag, maybe it's not. That's entirely situational dependent on what space you are in. And if you've actually looked at that and whatnot, you are actually still, because this is one of the things that also happens when you are still inside, like I can still have those thoughts. I can still have that pressure, that energetic pressure. And sometimes it's not mine. Sometimes having been out in the world and, you know, going to Walmart and getting the groceries and running errands and going, 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 going all day. I can have that pressure from people just being around other people mm -hmm. or un unconscious. And this is why being present with self is so important is to differentiate, is to have that practice of going inside and feeling who you are in that stillness without the swing of emotions, without the swing of the energy going back and forth, trying to pull you this way and that. And it's also okay if you realize at some point that you've created something that with the wrong intention or the wrong energy because you didn't know. Yep. Yep. And to be gentle with yourself yep. and to say, oh, oh, I wasn't really creating that the way I wanted to. But now I can change that. Yes. Because it's okay. There's a, I think we're so hard on ourselves and we can be hard on other people yeah. too yeah. that we didn't do it the right way. Yeah. And we, and but, we totally reject ourselves yeah. and our um, role in, in the creation of that particular event or whatever because we didn't like it. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's just like, ah, that was like, yeah. oh, that wasn't how I wanted it or like, or like, you know, honestly, it's just like, you know, the eggs didn't turn out right that morning, you know, the, yeah. the, the whole thing is, is that you have to understand that you can't reject the moment that you're in. And we're so used to rejecting yeah. a moment, the moment that we're in, because we're so used to judging ourselves that we don't realize we're judging ourselves mm -hmm. and we're in that moment, in that space, instead of being in the moment for ourselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we get caught in that judgment mm -hmm. in that rejection of everything because we're judging we're busy mine's going no 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 too busy over here rejecting stuff judging stuff mm -hmm. except it feels like you're doing stuff right and this is this is one of the tricks that the ego and shadow play on you is they slip in that sneaky little hook to like pull you into that dialogue and this is one of the one of the reasons again why being present is so important because sometimes that dialogue happens that negative script tries to sneak back in just from being around other people whose negative dialogue is so loud but, but it's not yours, it's yours. you yeah. think yeah it's so it's loud you think it's yours yeah. but it's yeah. not yeah because other people's thoughts like you can when you actually feel your own thoughts and hear your own thoughts mm -hmm. you'll you'll begin to differentiate when when someone else's thoughts are trying to become yours, yes, that they're trying to sneak in there and, yep. and, and become yours and to open up that in you. And you're like, wait a minute, that's, that's not me. I don't really feel like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> you'll, you'll be else. feeling a certain way after, mm -hmm. you know, and then like you weren't yeah. that way before you went out and did errands and you came back and like, everything is fine. <laughs> you go out and do errands, you come back and it's like, ah, the world's ending. And then she's like, yeah, hold on a <laughs> second. Wait, what just yeah. happened? Or, yeah, or someone else is having a bad day and then you feel like you can't be happy. Yep. But why? Because yep. just because they're having a bad day, you don't have to give away your joy mm -hmm. or your happiness just because which, someone else is. Which brings us to no, actual con yeah. conscious active <clears throat> participation in how we create our reality. And again, this goes back to karma. This goes back to reincarnation. This is the whole ball of wax. Yes, it's all connected, really. It's all like connected. That, the two questions are yeah. different, but they're... Yeah, they're, 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 we're, we're all... There's a theme here. Yeah. There's a theme. Um, active conscious participation. This is kind of like being mindful, but this is also understanding that with stillness comes more actual control, not through control and judging and rejecting, but control of being still and present with self. Mm -hmm. That you actively participate in a completely different level when you are disciplined with yourself and you are present and you are being responsible with your energy in how you are creating 
and talking to yourself and relating to the outside world, whether or not there's rejection or judgment or fear or love or whatever going on, when you can consciously understand the active level of participation that you are using to create through stillness, through being present with yourself, it changes completely. You're no longer caught in that swing of the pendulum going back and forth and you have more discipline so that you can stop it. It changes the way you think. It changes the way you feel about stuff. It can be disconcerting sometimes because your ego attachments, when they really break, you will suddenly feel like putting on your socks feels weird <laughs> or sipping your tea, your coffee that you had a million times before, exactly the same way and exactly the same cup at exactly the same spot on the table suddenly feels completely weird. And that is an indication that you have actually changed the way you consciously participate in your reality, that you have actually become more present with yourself and that you actually have a such a strong shift that it has become a physically jarring almost sensation where nothing feels right. And you have to understand that this is normal because this is another level of creation, another level of feeling when the emotional and the mental baggage becomes integrated and transmuted and healed, you will literally feel a physical difference in your reality because things have changed so much. So this is why it's like uh, worrying about the... There in lies with sweetness yes. in every day. Yes, exactly, yes. The, yeah, the, the simple things to, to me have become mm -hmm. so sweet where it's just like just mm -hmm. sitting up in the morning or putting on my clothes, it's like, there, there really is a simplicity in the simple thing, the sweetness in enjoying the simple things in life. And the more I do my work, the more like just coming home for crying out loud was <laughs> awesome today. I mean, I, I had a great time with my dad. I was snowed in with him for like almost three days. And, but coming home was great. What's that to like? I was here. I mean, hey, no, yeah, right. Kidding. You know, <laughs> who am I saying <laughs> anything different? Yeah. It, it, the, the conscious participation that happens when it's not about control but allowing but you are controlling yourself so this is where the 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 judgment of control sort of gets uh misunderstood yeah. because when we control ourselves when we discipline ourselves with acceptance and allowance and love it changes absolutely everything you don't have to control the outside world if you're controlling yourself you don't have to worry about the outside world if you're disciplined and you're present with yourself. You don't. So all of those, all those fears and the anxieties and, and the issues with creating or doing anything in the outside world, they just, they, they, they dissolve, they disappear because the attachment to them, the ego attachment that creates that karma, that perpetuates that cycle just goes away. Yeah, I'll leave my four bits there. Thank you, Kelly and Kelly. Beautiful. Parla, did you want to say something about this? Yes, I do. Um, I've been going through a cleansing, in, an internal cleansing of sorts, and a, a deep awareness of another level of releasing. And um, I think maybe I'll talk about that on Friday. But the insight I have had in this discussion is that my question is an ego question. My, e my ego had that question. It's a like, oh, but, oh, but, oh, but if you do that, you're creating its opposite. Oh, dear. What does that mean? Does that mean you can't do this? You know, that's the sense of that question. And I get, I get that it's ego and I get that it's shadow. And that shadow has become very cl clear to me, at least the next level. I don't know what's under that, but the next level, um, it has to do with mother again. It has to do with my relationship with my mother. And the one I thought I'd healed all the way. That's not all the way. And it's, it's, it's been a cloud. It's like a swirling, swirling mass around me that affects every, the way I think and the way I, the way I do everything. And, but once I became aware of that, it's interesting how I became aware of that. But once I became aware of it, it's cleared up. It's, I can see it and it's not 
inhibiting me anymore. Um, I can even speak more clearly. I can say what's true for me. And so I'm extremely grateful uh, to everybody because I see different perspectives. And I think Kelly and Kelly have really, really, really hit, hit my nail on the head tonight. And thank you ever so much. Your, your growth and your development is making a huge difference. And, and I can feel the cleansing coming through um, because the energy is being released. The energy is finally being released. And I, uh, I'm just so grateful. Just, I can't, I can't express my gratitude right now. Thank you ever so much, everybody. Beautiful. You're incredible, Marla. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your vulnerability and courage in asking the question. And I would agree with what Kelly said, which is just because we think that there is the positive, but I am also creating the negative. So if I say we are, I'm going to create a workshop, I'm also creating the negative, which is they may not be a workshop, right? But as Kelly says, because there's presence power in all the session leaders, and the people attending, the workshop will happen. Just like the group meditation, the last two weeks of December, the Facebook Lives would not have happened and the group meditations would not have happened because my internet connection was unstable. But presence power, right? We wanted to meet our intention. It's a clear, physical, practical example of what Kelly's saying. Our intention to meet for the Facebook Lives our intention to meet, our positive intention, the collective intention to be there for the group, how much Vidya and Patricia and Ken love just joining at that hour, right? They join 40 minutes early and they want to be there. Lakshmi is there. Like they want to be there together for that meditation that kept the internet connection up. And we met. I clearly see what I need to what what I need to do, and that is to really uh, bear down on my presence practice and get and get deeper and get more. You know, I just to get to get more centered, and so I can discern better. I can discern more clearly. So, wow, wow. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you. This is mind boggling. Thank you so much. Eternally grateful to all of you for being here. And it's an honor and a privilege as always. Have a fantastic evening. Many blessings. Much love to all of you. Uh, many blessings and see you all next Wednesday. And some of you this coming Friday. Take care. Bye. Good night.